Good morning and welcome to our speakers and delegates from around the UK, from Australia, Austria, India, Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, Taiwan, and from Tennessee and Texas in the United States of America. More than 55 million people worldwide, 944,000 in the UK, live with a rare inherited or young onset dementia, of whom between 5 and 15% receive a diagnosis. These conditions tend to occur at a younger age than the more common form of Alzheimer's disease and can cause symptoms that are not only memory related, for example, difficulties with vision, language, movement, and behavioral changes and others. Today's conversation will be chaired by Professor Sebastian Crutch, who many of you will know, Professor of Neuropsychology at UCL, and will be co-chaired by his rare dementia support creative consultant, Charles Harrison. And for the Italian perspective, Eloisa Stella and Dr. Christian Leorin of Novelugno in Padua, Italy. Rare dementia support provides for seven rare dementias, posterior cortical atrophy, primary progressive aphasia, frontotemporal dementia, familial frontotemporal dementia, familial Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia, and young onset Alzheimer's disease. Personal expression through creative activities, whether reviving or learning afresh, spending time in nature and with others, enables enduring sense of achievement or hope of connection as case studies on their inspirational rare space website illustrate, and indeed our, team, our Italian team. Their members, Helena and Chris from Sussex and Tiziano and Frank from Italy, each living with a different type of dementia, are going to give us insight into how engaging with their chosen creative and cultural activities enhance their lives. We shall also hear from Tony Thompson and Rebecca Goldston, co-directors of Sweet Patuti Arts, whose film The Turning Point gives the Caribbean perspective, the importance of heritage and arts-based support. On the question of access, participants can join arts programmes for their rare dementias at any stage in their diagnostic journey, chiefly through neurological referral and the marvels of Googling rare dementia, but on a personal level, the growing availability of social prescribing link workers to an individual's GP to address a person's wider social and cultural needs can ease access to these arts to preserve brain health from the outset of symptoms. But at any stage, Monica Bolton of the National Academy for Social Prescribing will explain. Before handing over to Seb, I should explain that the instigator of this Changemaker Conversation series, Baroness Greengross, was passionate about the need for music and the arts to be embedded in the health and social care system for dementia. Sally, our dear friend, Arts for Dementia patron and co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Dementia, worked indefatigably to advance Arts for Brain Health strategy in Parliament. We are truly grateful to our speakers, whose guidance inspires best practice in arts for brain health the world over. To Nigel Franklin of A4D for technological wizardry and to our colleague Amisha, who will keep an eye on and preserve the chat and help edit the recording for an online resource together with this transcript. If you would like to upload your own resources, we shall add these too. Now I should like to introduce Professor Sebastian Crutch. Seb is Professor of Neuropsychology at the Dementia Research Center, UCL Institute of Neurology and is the clinical lead for rare dementia support. His research focuses on rare and young onset dementias, especially post posterior cortical atrophy, the visual variant of Alzheimer's disease. The work has led to improved understanding of dementia-related visual impairment and the causes and consequences of atypical Alzheimer's more generally. From 2016 to 18, Seb directed the creative created out of mind residency at Welcome Collection Hub, bringing together artists, scientists, and people living with dementia in a collaboration of over 60 individuals, institutions, and charities, aiming to shape and enrich public and professional perceptions of the dementias, and to explore the opportunities afforded by collaborative, interdisciplinary, publicly situated research. 
Seb, it is an honour to welcome you as chair. Thanks ever so much. And thank you um, to you all for being here and to Veronica for inviting us. And yes, it's an honour to do anything in Dame Sally's name. Um, so a real pleasure to contribute to this. And I think, I hope you can see on screen with me, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Charlie Harrison. Um, so uh, just to explain the format for this afternoon, I hope you have are sitting comfortably, perhaps have a nice coffee or tea. Uh, and the idea is to keep this very informal and discursive. Uh, we won't be boring you to death with PowerPoint, I hope. Uh, we will, however, be sharing um, ideas, inspirations, anecdotes, a few facts along the way. Um, and generally talking a little bit about how our work in dementia and the arts has, has come together and conjoined. And most importantly, as Veronica said, hearing from people living with or supporting someone and caring for, with and for and about someone who's living with a diagnosis of one of these rarer dementia conditions um, to understand a little bit more about what it really means to engage in the arts and what some of the, the benefits and the impacts can be. Um, so Charlie and I will just uh, kick this off a little bit. Um, Veronica has very kindly introduced me, uh, Charlie, at length. I wondered if you might introduce yourself to everybody and say a little bit about yourself. Um, and then we're going to ask each other a few questions for the first 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, so yeah, hi everybody. Um, I'm Charlie Harrison. And yeah, thanks very much for inviting us to, to bring this together today. We're, we're really looking forward to, to opening up these conversations. Um, Seb and I don't get loads of opportunities to sort of like share some of this work and it, it's really nice to be able to um, hear, hear from our members and yeah to talk about arty things. So I, I'm, I'm a sort of um, I'm a visual artist um, by background and got involved in this area of work about 10 years ago. Um, sort of by chance, um, but um, yeah, we'll go into that a little bit more. So I currently coordinate um, Rare Space, which is a new part of the Rare Dementia Support, ser um, support Service. Um, and we're particularly interested in the sort of creative and cultural lives of our members um, and sort of thinking about how these things impact on people's um, everyday life, um, bringing about sort of positivity and change um, as people adapt to their sort of changing circumstances. Um, so Seb, I was going to ask you a few questions to start off with, I think. Um, and I, I suppose the sort of obvious one to, to start with is um, what, what do we mean when we say rare dementia? Um, Thank you. So uh, we re often get asked why why we use the word rare, because it seems to suggest that this is a sort of a, a niche interest. So um, I suppose first to say is by rare, we mean um, atypical, i.e. non-memory-led non, non -led dementias, young onset dementias, so people living uh, with conditions where the symptoms or the diagnosis happen before they're 65, um, and also inherited forms of dementia. So obviously all of us are at some degree of genetic risk um, or greater likelihood of developing a dementia at some point in our lives. But there are some relatively, mercifully relatively few, but still some families who live with a specific mutation in their family uh, that gets passed from generation to generation with 50% of all siblings in any generation um, being likely to get the condition if one of their parents has carried the gene. Um, so direct, directly inherited forms of dementia. Um, and so rare dementias are those which don't typically fit with most people's stereotypes or assumptions about dementia. I think despite great awareness building, uh, there still resist, resides the, the temptation to think or to associate dementia with uh, much older people and, and with memory. And um, many of the people we work with buck one or both of those um, assumptions. Um, but by rare, we actually often don't mean it, it's not necessarily that uh, numerically infrequent. We're probably talking about 15% of all dementia not, not being so-called typical um, late onset Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia, which are the, the two dementias which most people have heard of. So 15% in the UK, that's about 145,000 people. So they're rarer, but not actually that, uh, not that rare. But, but sadly, many, many people don't have, don't get ever get that diagnosis. Still many people are, are told you, you've got dementia, no more information than that. Um, mm -hmm. Or a diagnosis would be given of Alzheimer's disease, perhaps not recognizing some of the more specific um, early, early features. 
that's great. Thank you. That's really clear. Um, yeah, I, rem I remember it sort of like when, when I first started being involved with this, like never really having any sort of um, awareness around it at all. So I, I feel like it's a really important part of our message to sort of share this information. And um, and also I, we hear a lot about very particular challenges that people face because of, because of um, some of the things you're talking about, about how difficult it can be to get a diagnosis, for example, um, and also because of some of the sort of quite particular symptoms that people have. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about some of those challenges that are quite specific to this area. Yeah, so some of the specific challenges, so lots, uh, Veronica mentioned at the beginning that we work with lots of people who perhaps whose dementia presents not with difficulties with memory, but difficulties with vision, with seeing what and where things are, with problems with language that might be understanding um, what is being said to them or what they're reading or being able to produce um, language and convey messages in the way they want to. Some dementias attack um, uh, particularly when attacking the front of the brain cause distinct changes in people's birth personality and behavior so lots of people um, perhaps who might be more socially disinhibited not be able to follow the, follow the kind of the social rules or norms in the way that they normally would and so do or say things um, or don't do or say things um, that they would otherwise have done and so I think when we're thinking about challenges and going back to your first question about what do we mean by rare we also, but when intentionally use the word rare to mean precious, because I think many people, most importantly, including some of the people you'll hear from directly a little in a few moments, um, are able, because their dementia starts with something other than memory, are able to give us very generous and informative insights into what many people with any kind of dementia at any age may experience perhaps a little bit later in, in, in the course of their dementia. So for example, lots of people, perhaps the majority of people with late onset memory led um, Alzheimer's will also develop problems with, with vision and with language at a later stage, but perhaps at a stage when they can't necessarily explain um, or communicate that to other people or have insight into it themselves. And so I think what we're hearing about today is not just stories of, of a personal nature but stories with a really important educational and public awareness um, raising um, message that we can't just think of um, dementia as presenting the challenges that it does initially sadly all of these are progressive diseases and so the challenges people were facing and the adaptations therefore when engaging people in different artistic and other opportunities will need to constantly will need to constantly be on our toes to adapt to adapt to those challenges yeah, I think that that's been such a sort of like clear um, part of like being involved in this area of work that sort of creativity is involved and threaded through so many different aspects of how 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 we sort of meet those challenges and um, and you you're not not just a psychologist as as Veronica mentioned you sort of um, sort of spearheaded the this two year residency at the Welcome Collection and had had a sort of previous research interest and background with sort of artistic. Um, work and creativity. I, I just wondered whether we, we should sort of start talking about art a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, so as you say, I'm I'm by no stretch an artist, um, but very, very early, you, you said that you fell into this area a little bit by chance. I, I feel the same, that I had the great privilege within a few months of starting work at the Dementia Research Centre in Queen Square right back in 1999, um, of meeting the visual artist William Utamolan who had recently been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, um, who was very generously taking part in, in a number of research programs. And so to get to know uh, him and his wonderful wife, Pat, and to understand a little bit about their story and how his experience of that condition were expressed through a quite a now famous series of self-portraits um, that he mm -hmm. painted and drew in the, in the, in the subsequent years. Um, so I guess that was my, my introduction. Um, but I guess thinking about creativity more broadly, almost all of my research that I've been privileged to take part in or to lead has been in some way inspired by um, or shaped by the experiences of people doing what you're about to do, <laughs> of, of talking to people who actually know really what they're talking about. People would very generously refer to me as an expert in dementia, but that's an expertise um, which is uh, derived almost entirely from the great privilege of speaking to hundreds of people with these so-called rare conditions and therefore being able to build up a, a, a picture, a blended picture from all those different experiences and all those individual differences 
of what the kind of common features of these conditions are. And so often it's people describing something um, that we've never heard of before, a difficulty with with balance or perceiving where something is or understanding a particular category of, of words or knowledge that has inspired us, sparked us to um, think of um, a, a new question or a, a new technique. Um, and I think broadly speaking, the dementias, as, as you know so well, Charlie, affect every aspect of life, uh, personal, social, thought-based, emotional-based, sensa our sensations can also be altered or the way we interpret them. And so we, I think the, the drive to involve creative um, approaches um, is really, it, it's not a kind of a, a, a choice or a niche interest. I think it's just a logical um, move that when you've got a set of conditions that can affect any aspect of human experience, why would we close off any tools at our disposal in order to try and understand what it what it means to live with that condition or to care for one about someone who does? So yeah. obviously you've said that you're an artist, and I wonder in particular if you could just explain to people a little bit about what got you involved in this area. But most importantly, given it's been a few years now, what's what's kept your passion and your drive and your resilience to work in this area? Yeah, so um, yeah, as, as mentioned, it's all, it happened by chance a little bit that you you and I were paired up for this project ten years ago called Art Neuro, which was a project that just paired up artists and neuroscientists to see what what might come out of that. Um, and I remember one of the first things you showed me was some some of the visual processing tests. So some some of the things that are used for assessment in in the process of diagnosis of some of these rarer dementias. And I I sort of found them quite fascinating. Um, because they seem to have a lot of links to artworks as well. And so that, that first project, although it was quite small, was, you know, it, it was just an artistic interpretation, some paintings made based off some of those visualisations. Um, I have to say, I, I didn't um, have a personal relationship to dementia, as so many people do who come to be involved in this area. It's often, you know, you've had a family member and that's a real driving force um, for it. Um, I actually think that's important as well, that the, 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 the people who don't necessarily have that personal connection also don't feel that they're like excluded from being involved in this area. I, I think at some point everyone's going to be touched by it and, it, and it's important um, that, that people do sort of engage with it. Um, also, over the years, I have, I have sort of developed a bit of a personal relationship with it because I've come to know and love so many amazing people. Um, who, who we who we work with. Um, so yeah, and I, I suppose just to answer the sort of what what's sort of keeping me involved um, in it. Well, it's lo lots of things really. I mean, part, partly that developing and building relationships with people, like seeing how important it can be to share their own creativity and um, how that sort of help helping people adapt and things like that can um, really build resilience. Um, it's very inspiring to work with people and see, see how they sort of meet the challenges head on. Um, and, you know, that, that's an amazing thing to see every day. Also, all of our colleagues, such as yourself and others at the Dementia Research Centre and uh, Rare Dementia Support, they're, they're just so amazing and, they, they you know, far, far more um, difficult tasks in our support team um, than I have. And it, it's really amazing to sort of work as part of that team. You know, everyone's heart is really in the right place and, and people work really hard. Um, and so, it, and also it's a very supportive environment. Well, if we provide support for others as well, um, we provide support for each other. Um, and that's an amazing play, way to work. And from a, a bit of a more personal perspective, I suppose um, it's, um, it's a re real opportunity to use my own imagination as well. I feel like creative health, when, when we were first starting, it wasn't so in the public domain. And now it, it feels like a lot of people are engaging with creative health and how, how important um, creativity and the arts can be for people's brains, um, brain health. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity out there, I suppose, in terms of like there's a lot of unexplored ideas and there's a lot of people coming into this area and I, I just feel like that's um yeah it's 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 interesting to work in an area where there is so much potential I yeah 
Absolutely. And Charlie, I just wanted to put on one word you use, which is maybe helps people to understand a bit about the kind of interdisciplinary nature of dementia and the arts work in that we don't just sit in our in our camps with me only thinking about science and you only think about you use the word assessment which i think most people would assume would be a, a me kind of word that i'm constantly doing conducting cognitive tests or brain scans with people whilst you might poo, -poo that and want them to express themselves can you just say a little bit more about how what you know where that intrigue or that interest in the notion of assessment came from or parallels yeah. that you drew with your own work i mean I, I suppose for me it was just what i i particularly found interesting from my own artistic perspective but over the period of time that we've been working it i also became very aware that it's a real sort of i suppose two things um I feel like assessments are a really important way of how us how neuropsychologists how the human race has come to understand how the brain works it's but it's a very blunt tool as well um and over the time i've spoken to people whenever i say to people living with rare dementias oh i'm interested in assessment or that's sort of been part of my work in this area people have so much to say and the vast majority of it isn't that positive as well it's a bit, as, as everyone knows it's a, a, an experience that so many people are familiar with being in that sort of situation where it's quite stressful and you feel quite put on um, and whilst the assessments often give us a sort of quite clear picture about some of the things that people might be finding challenging they also don't necessarily give us a really clear picture of how that um, sort of applies to people's everyday lives and the sorts of things they might want to be doing like like painting or like <laughs> like going out in the garden or like seeing family members and things um, and because there is this relationship between um, assessment and art, I feel, um, I think the, the, that for me, that was a particular area where we might be able to sort of like find some real interdisciplinary um, sort of ways forward. Um, and we don't have time today, <laughs> but I, I, the, the, with sort of the research side of my role has sort of developed quite a lot with, with that area, in particular thinking about how painting and drawing can sort of offer quite um sort of ways of sort of understanding people's experience that also um don't sort of shy away from how unique everybody is and how how we can sort of express that variability um in a way that also like builds a clearer picture of the experiences that people are going through um so yeah i probably if, if i start talking about any of those projects i'll be going to <laughs> so I, I should probably leave well, that there. well that's fine but i think after the event we can circulate a little bit of information about your talking lines as an example of that so a project in which is really used drawing to complement other forms of interview um by which researchers like me would typically try to get at people's experience of what works and doesn't work and is challenging living with mm -hmm. or caring for in this situation but that's great thank you charlie one other quick thing just um again veronica mentioned at the beginning about a uh, rare space um which is part of the, the rare dementia support service could you just say briefly what that is just a little bit of context yeah so i, I suppose like having done work for a few years in this area as a sort of artist who's finding ways to represent and work with and collaborate with researchers and people with lived experience, I, I became increasingly uncomfortable that, as you say, the most important thing is to hear from those people. And like through working with people, I realized that there's so many creative people in our membership out there who are doing amazing things and finding ways to sort of um, meet their challenges. Um, and so we sort of wanted to prioritize that a little bit. And, and I think some, in some ways that came out of during COVID, we, we ran a, a sort of creativity club where a group of people came together to meet online. Um, and it was just incredible to see how much um, it meant to people and that people were learning new things um, and finding new skills and meeting new people. And um, yeah, I suppose that there was just a lot of things um, sort of like um, building social connections and peer support um, and sharing their stories with others as well. And so I, we wanted to find ways to sort of share those stories with wider audiences um, and also look for new partnerships with other organisations sort of in line with social prescribing. Um, so we've had like partnerships with places like the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust. Um, last year there was a um, garden at Chelsea Flower Show which um, was sort of co-designed with um, people living with PCA, um, which we're going to hear a bit more about. Um, 
There's also a project with Wigmore Hall, which has been a sort of ongoing project, sort of um, music based. Um, and so it's sort of about providing opportunities and linking people up with opportunities that might be appropriate for them, encouraging people to try new things um, and, yeah, and to sort of think about new areas of research as well. Great. Thank you, Charlie. That's really, really helpful. Um, so we'll return to a few of those themes in a moment. Um, but I think before um, you're going to uh, be um, interviewing Helena and David um, about their experience of living with with posterior cortical atrophy or PCA um, and particularly their involvement in different um, artistic and creative activities. Um, we just wanted to show you all a short film or just a segment of a short film. Um, and I suppose the reason for showing you this is, I guess one tension in the dementia and arts field sometimes is between the, the sciencey bits and the artsy bits. Um, and we don't really, I don't really buy that as a as a real tension. Um, sometimes, certainly when I'm reading dementia and arts literature, I feel a little bit um, scolded sometimes. People talk about the, the biomedical model, and I think that probably applies to people like me working in a neurological institute. But I think we, we I often use um, a quote by William Osler that says, don't ask what disease the person has, but instead ask what disease, what person the disease has. And we tend to try and uh, whilst I agree with that, also try and modify it a little bit to say, well, why don't we ask both what who the person is and what the disease is, it's simply as a way of um, not anticipating who the individual is or what's important to them, but just understanding a little bit of the context in which they live and some of the challenges that they might be facing, um, and therefore some of the ways in which we might want or need to adapt um, some of the um, offerings that we make and our creative opportunities that we provide. Um, so this is a short film. So case in point is, um, uh, as you, as Helena will say for herself in a moment, she lives with this condition, um, posterior cortical atrophy, which literally means back of the brain shrinkage. Um, but rather than having me lecture you about what PCA is, I will tell you briefly that it is literally, as it suggests, it's a most commonly a form of Alzheimer's disease where those proteins affect not the memory centers um, in the middle of the brain, but the visual centers at the back of the brain to start with. Um, but as I say, much better than me talking about it is to show you a few moments of a short film by the filmmaker and animator Simon Ball, in which he has responded to people's lived, lived experience descriptions of the condition. Um, and that's what you'll hear a little bit of just now. An ordinary eye test won't necessarily show much. So if you're looking at A, B, D, E, F, that's not a problem. But if you're trying to read a line... I get the first word, and when I go on to the second word, the first word's gone. Some from this sentence, and some from this sentence, and then coming back up to this sentence. Blobs on a piece of paper. Everything does dance around all the letters, and eventually it just becomes one big blur. I've read extensively all my life, and I can barely read. I'm writing a crowded page. It is, it's moving, it's mutating, it's everything in you. C, 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 H, U, R, C, 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 H. Fs instead of fives, Bs instead of Ps, Ps instead of Bs. There's a number of funny little things in my brain. And sometimes some do things, and sometimes others do things. It's very frustrating to go to get something and it's not there, but it's there. <laughs> I can often see things faster if they're moving. And so if a bird flies across his vision, he's got it. He knows what that he bird is, he can is. see it exactly as it was before, because yeah. it's somehow it's dragged his eye to it. The glare when you're walking along, it's very, very bright. And there's shadows and reflections or glistening puddles. Is it real? Is it solid ground? Is it something you're going to go down? Going downstairs, I can't see my feet. I always feel for the first step so I can gauge 
the rhythm of the stairs. You do not know where to put your feet, so you get vertigo. It gives you vertigo. Well, it's like standing on the edge of something that you could just jump. I can play all the notes, but not necessarily in the right order. I can make a cup of tea, but if Graham talks to me in the middle of that, I will forget at what stage I was at. Oh, yeah. First of all, I've got to find a cup. It's almost as though he must be able to see it. I, I can see it, but I can't you see can't where, where it, it is. is. I still couldn't see it. So, where? There. Where? There! <laughs> there's a real one and there's an image. I can't distinguish between them. You have to sort of dismiss the whole image somehow and then get it to reassemble the whole thing and then the kettle might be there again. Like your, your reading glasses are in the midst of a load of other things. You can't spot them very easily. The whole thing, you do see it rather like a, a, a broidal painting or a sort of crowded, surreal. My fingers were like bananas. I can't use the phone properly. You can remember the code for your cash point, but you couldn't work the machine to put them in the right order. Oh, yeah, I, I can see uh, the computer and something will come up on the screen. But, uh, if I press the wrong key, then I'm stuck. Okay, so I hope that gives a little bit of an insight into some of the um, experiences um, and uncertainties of living with this condition, which affects not eyesight, but brain sight. Um, so on that topic, with that as a little bit of background and context, um, I'll let Charlie um, introduce our first speakers, Helen and David. Ah, great, and um, they've, they've, they've arrived. Hello, Helen and David. Hello. Um, Hello. So uh, just as a very quick introduction, Helen and David are, are really creative people who I, I've got to know a little bit over the last um, year or so, and they're involved in lots of things like singing. They were involved in the Chelsea Garden that I mentioned briefly. Um, in a previous Wigmore Hall project. Um, they've also spoken to me about going for a swim in the sea um, and um, also rewilding their garden. Um, and we often talk about our dogs as well. Um, so all of these things, um, per perfectly valuable topics of conversation. But um, yeah, I, I wondered if you could start off just telling us a little bit about yourself um, and when you started making art, Helena. Um... So I probably started doing art when I was a child because my parents both painted. Um, but then after being a child, it sort of became a thing where, well, that's what they do. And I'm a teenager and I'm not going to do that. So I didn't do any art at that point. Um, yeah. And um, well, the interesting thing was that it was when Helena's parents had died, so this is going back um, seven or eight years, I guess now. Mm -hmm. There was clearly, you know, Helena, I, I suspected that Helena could have painted because, you know, our sons, I mean, I have no um, artistic uh, drawing painting ability really, but our sons are both very good. very good, partly because they were taught by Helena's parents. And I'm thinking, well, it's probably in there, but there's been this sort of thing of, um, not wanting to be inferior to your parents, I suppose, as a, as, you know, from Helen. <laughs> well, after they died, Helen wanted to, to, to do some art. Yes, art. She'd been studying art history. Um, did a lot of art history. Yeah. yeah. And you signed up for a, a, um, uh, a course at a local college called um, So You Think You Can't Draw. And it was this artist who would basically kind of, kind of teach drawing in a very, very um, conventional way and uh, I mean this was uh, probably three or four years before we'd really understood that Helen was having visual problems they, they were oh yeah you know the eye eye tests weren't quite you know glasses were a bit funny but you know we did no idea that anything much was going on but lo and behold I think that I mean you, you kept going for a half a term or something mm -hmm. but they then decided that as far as um, uh, this art class is, was concerned. Helena couldn't draw because uh, already the PTA was giving her a distorted sense of space that meant any attempts to uh, try and be representational, you know, learning to draw ellipses, you know, the, the sort of classic sort of thing, 
um, just wasn't on, you know, it just wasn't there at all. So that was deeply demoralizing, upsetting sort of thing to go through, was. wasn't it? And, yeah. And it was, it was very strange, you know, but... Um, but the interesting thing now I realise is that, you know, because one of the things that I have found, you know, from the beginning that is, that's really strange, it's the spatial stuff. So, you know, if, yeah, um, yeah, the, uh, yeah. Because I, they, I couldn't get into a car because of the you know spatial aspects of you know knowing which foot has to go here or there or not because I was going to drive don't worry but you know because I, I you yeah, know it was just really complicated all of a sudden yeah finding the door of the car became mm. a an impossibility and, and uh, very bizarre um, sort of thing where. Um, there was a left-right thing going on, and, and Helena would, would often, um, if you like, not understand the left side of something. So the car only had a right-hand side, mm -hmm. and then the right-hand side of the car only had a door on the right-hand side of that, which was the driver's door. So whenever Helena approached a car, she would try and get in the driver's door. <laughs> really strange. <laughs> Very odd. Very yeah. odd very odd and troubling um, situations as well and so that that situation with the original art class you went to as well sounds really sort of dismissive and terrible and I know now having spoken to you quite recently that you you often refer to yourself as an artist Helena so that feels like quite a long way to have come um, yes. Kind of then. And yes. Yeah, so I didn't know whether you wanted to sort of give us a bit of a tour of some of your paintings as you sort of speak about that 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 journey as well maybe. Yeah, yeah. Where, where do you want to start? Yeah. Should we start with the Wigmore Hall thing? Because you mentioned the Wigmore Hall project. So very early after Helena's diagnosis, we got involved with the project with the Wigmore Hall, which was a, a music thing, but it was all online during lockdown. And um, it, it rapidly uh, became a, a sort of mix of music. There were music students who were improvising in response to stories that, that people with... Um, PCA and other conditions we're, we're telling. And we were in the sort of immediate post-diagnosis sort of grief phase where um, it, everything was very, very difficult. But um, uh, we ended up, it became a, um, something where we, well, it was Helena's session really, but, but mm -hmm. the, out of it came sort of tasks for the next week and challenges to go and observe mm -hmm. outdoors and. Um, so one of the first things was um, uh, we found a piece of seaweed on the beach that Helena was particularly fond of. I and like the shape of it. This, this, this was a silhouette of the seaweed, um, sort of duplicated many times, that Helena then coloured in. In different colours. In, in, yeah, to, to sort of respond to, you know, the joy of suddenly seeing that seaweed it was really pretty. Was really pretty. Um, and of course, you know, we'd lived next to the sea for ages and but, you know, never, got, never got there. So that was one of the first it things, was, wasn't it? It was. And uh, there are some other examples on the rare space site where Helena has a page of, of some things which expressed how she was feeling. The, 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 was really the angry tunnel and yes, yes. The things like that. So you can go there and see some of those. Um, but the, 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 the really big thing was to find a, an arts group um, that's run out of one of our local um, sight loss charities run by um, a couple of um, art therapists and um, you talk about talk about what that's like oh so uh, yes I so I was looking for a group and I knew that I wanted to be in a group rather than just doing it by myself um, and doing the art by myself and luckily, I think though I went to the local, um, it was the, um, uh, the local, um, the site support place. No, it wasn't the site support place. It was um, near the, um, can't come out. Mm. Anyway, okay, it doesn't really matter. We, we can't we can't remember how no. we, we got yeah, it was... in touch with this the, these people, but um... no, I went to the um, the uh, local um, museum uh, museum. I went to the local museum 
said to them, Have, do you know anybody who, you know, is doing some art that's, you know, and I've got a visual impairment, so, you know, it has to be, you know, of a particular nature. Um, and they sort of said, oh, yeah, we, you know, we know two people and, you know, we could give them a call. Or, and um, um, yeah. So it was a combination of the two and the two things together got me into, um, yeah. And you, you've mentioned in the past that, like, um, so obviously making artworks, I, I, I hope you, you've got a few more that you can show us. Yeah, yeah. But um, the, there's, there are obviously, like, particular challenges um, with PCA for making things. But I, I've heard you speak before about um, taping off areas of the canvas so that you can sort of focus on particular areas yeah. and things or, or talking about... Um, I, I, you, you spoke in a lovely way about um, having a particular painting you had made where you it, the sound of it was um, particularly nice because you had tap, you made it out of plaster and you could tap it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Find that. Yeah. So this is it's a, it's a very abstract thing, but it has if you if you go in close, it's got a lot of texture. It's got a lot of texture. And. Uh, it's lovely. And so, how does it make you feel, Helena, when when you when you're making this this work? Um, I, oh no, I really enjoyed it. I liked the feel of it, and I liked um, it, yeah, I really it re I don't I, don't, I, I didn't really felt like it was mine. I think I I think I did it just after I'd been up to London to see the um. Exhibition, summer exhibition, summer exhibition. Royal Academy. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and um, so it inspired me, um, and I, I think that's one of the things about art as well, isn't it? That you can go somewhere, see something, and you know it'll give you an idea. Um, yeah, yeah um, one of the first, Sorry. one <laughs> of the first things that Helena did with the art group is actually behind her on the wall. If you lean over to me a bit, they'll see it, which is very abstract and uh it's sort of quite drippy and uh <laughs> um but it's just it's great you know it's um it's just got so much vibrant color and and i think that you know pca may lose shape but color is still really really important yeah. you know? and, uh, and I, I think i think that's it like the, that growing confidence that I've, I've seen in you helena as well through making this art as well and and you've also mentioned about go you go because you go to a regular group um where you mm -hmm. speak with um, other people and like you know you're inspired by their work they're inspired by yours and, and I, I I often find that those group groups are sort of quite helpful um yeah. is, is that does that resonate with you yeah absolutely I, I I'm really glad that I'm in a group yeah I, it would you know I, mean, I, I can see that the real um quality the expertise of the therapists who work there to you know facilitate Helena to to do the art, but to to sort of be there, sort of very gently, sort of no. doing things to, to make it work, to make it not go wrong. You know, this sort of masking off thing. Um, it's it's quite tactile, and I you know, see mm -hmm. see them getting hold of her hands and putting them on the uh, you know on on the paper and, and say, look, put this, put your hand here, and then work work in this space, you know, to, to frame, you know, this is what you're doing now, you know, and, uh, but the, you always have the ideas, don't you? And you, yes. you, you yeah. sort of get to the end of one um, piece of work and then you're always thinking, what am I going to do next? And, and often it's very intangible, just about a, a colour or something. I'm going to do something in whatever colour and, uh, or it might be something to do with, you know, the beach or, or something like that. We had quite a lot of inspiration from our um, involvement with the Chelsea Flower Show. As oh, well. yeah. So oh, yes. That, um, yeah, went a bit flower bonkers. Yeah. So, <laughs> that was, I'll show you some of those. <laughs> yeah, I thought that might be a nice thing to see just to, as we wrap up a little bit. But yeah, so. That's a, that's a nice flowery one, you see. So. Mm. And yeah, and I think you said you made that almost the day you came back from visiting Chelsea after the garden had been sort of shown. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I just wish I could um, have the smell. 
I, I think we're all getting a sense of the smell there, Helen, yeah. as well. Wow. Like such a, such a beautiful painting there. Um, unfortunately, I think I think just by the nature of these events and how time keeps ticking by, I think yeah. we're going to have to um, bring that to, um, to a close. But thank thank you so much for sharing some of your work and talk, talking us through um, how how that sort of process has been. Um, in terms of yeah it's it's so great to see you talk about your art and, and yeah. I, i'm a big fan <laughs> yeah thank you and um uh, yeah it's so um, it's really good i love it it's clearly a massively massively important part of Helen's well-being yeah to be involved with this kind of thing and and she sings in a community choir not a dementia choir i think just a local um you know any ability group and again you know that expression um I think is a key to dealing with these things. If you can't, mm. if you can't get out and and do something like mm. these things and do and things with other people, people. yeah. It, uh, mm. you know, otherwise, you'd be spending far, far too long with me. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Helen and David, for sharing that. I think you've been a fine advocate for. I think we should all go a little bit flower bonkers or bonkers in, in inspired by whatever we're engaging with at the moment. But that's great. Thank you. And I know you're kind of staying on to join us in the panel discussion a little bit later on. So uh, we shall hear some more soon. Um, just before um, Charlie speaks um, with Chris and Andrea, I thought it'd be helpful for me just to also mention that, of course, visual uh, dementia is not the only types of uh, conditions that we try to support um, through rare dementia support um, and as you'll hear in a moment much much better from, from Chris and Andrea and via their work um, we also support people living with types of dementia which affect language um, and so the broad category of, of conditions is called primary progressive aphasias or PPA um, which really just means that language takes the prominent role earlier on um, and is a progressive change in those abilities. And there are at least three different types of, of language-led dementia, some like uh, semantic dementia, which affect one's understanding and the sort of the type of memory that we have, not for day-to-day -day events, but for sort of facts and knowledge about the world, including what words mean. Um, another type of uh, PPA, which um, is called as a non-fluent progressive aphasia, which means people understand perfectly well um, and know exactly the message they're trying to convey, um, but the fluency of their speech um, and their ability to use grammar um, and to articulate um, sounds and words in the way that they normally would have uh, is progressively affected. Um, and then a third type, which Chris um, and Andrea know much more about than me, called the logopenic variant um, uh, uh, of, of primary progressive aphasia, where things like word finding and repetition and hesitancy when creating sentences um, are issues that come to the fore um, earlier on. But that's a bit of background because the most important thing is not, as we've said, what disease um, the person has, but the person um, living with that condition. And that's uh, what Charlie and Chris and Andrew will be talking about a little bit in the next few minutes. Fantastic. Thanks, Ed. And welcome, Chris and Andrea. Um, thanks so much for being with us today. Again, more very creative people who um, I've sort of been getting to know over the last couple of years. So just a very quick intro that you um, have interest in drawing and painting and poetry, um, cooking together, um, gardening, playing football with the grandkids. I know Chris is a big Burnley FC fan. <laughs> Um, and visiting museums. You told me that this week you've been to see the um, Turner Prize at Towner Gallery as well, which is lovely, <laughs> lovely to hear you've been getting out and about as well. So, um, yeah, I was just going to start by saying, Chris, um, did, did you want to just introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I live in Sussex. Uh, Andrea's my wife. 50 years, was it? 50 years last year, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's it's now pretty much um, three years since I was di diagnosed with logo clinic aphasia. Um, very debilitating. De debilitating. Um, I know what I want to see, okay. to say, but I can't see, see them. 
Um, I, I have good medication, um, good speech therapy, uh, and both help. And I, I feel that from the three years, um, I'm pretty much, that's, that's where I still am, um, which is... That's quite good. Um, um, it's, it's having a sentence in your head and he knows what he wants to say, but he, he hesitates and he can't get the word out. Um, mm. and, um, it's, it can be quite frustrating. Mm. That must be so frustrating. And also in, in social situations, we, we live in such a fast paced world now as well. Pe people aren't so great at giving people space and time. And um, yeah. yeah, that must be so, so difficult. And I, I just wondered whether you wanted to tell us a little bit more about that and, and whether you feel creativity helps at all. Um, well, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the point now that um, I know what I can do and I know what I can't do. And, and when I can't do things, it's, I, I just walk, walk along. You know, I, I just want to keep, keep going on. Um, until I can't do anything. Um, um, yeah, we 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 have we have a good life. Um, got very very. Lots of various various things we enjoy, including art. Um, but I don't do as much art as. Uh, Helen. Helen does <laughs> by a long way. Um, but drawing, painting, um, I always liked it at, at school. Um, but uh, I, I didn't. I didn't go uh, painting or, or drawing for a, a very long time. And I was just just thinking. Uh, it was when we were in Hungary. Mm -hmm. um, and we had our our boys there, and um, we had a day that we all had a painting, and it was it was really good. And then I never did anything for about thirty years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and that was just because we, we work, we've got children, and gets a lot of things to do. Um, but it was when. Um, Oh, lockdown. Lockdown. Um, so when lockdown was there, we uh, got a lot of uh, stuff. Painting. Paintings, painting, painting and drawing. And, and, and it seemed that we could, we were quite good. Um, <laughs> great. <laughs> well, we never really. It was only something that we quite enjoyed doing, both of us, and um, drew with the children. We like going to art galleries, but um, it's a little bit like a lot of hobbies. You have to invest a lot of time in it. And then lockdown just brought that opportunity where we had hours in the day where we had not a lot to do and so we both started painting and then we discovered how much we enjoyed it and we discovered that we were not too bad at it and um, so uh, we've carried on um, we don't do as much as we did in lockdown but we still we still draw we still paint um, we, we're not good enough not not as good as Helen to put a picture on the wall uh, but we decided that um, rather than just keep them in a drawer, that we would draw pictures for our friends and our relatives. And, um, and we've created um, birthday cards and anniversary cards, Christmas cards. So do you want to say a bit more about that, Chris? Um, yeah. The... Do you want to show the latest one that you've done? Yeah, I mean, the last, the last thing I did was... At the football ground, which is <laughs> so this one has yet to be made into a card, but Chris, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, that's Brentford Football Club ground. Um, uh, and I, I go I go there quite often. 
uh, and I've got a, a friend who kept, um, comes me to the matches. Um, and sometime, I don't know when, uh, he'll, he'll get a birthday card for me. I think um, it's September. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got another one, uh, which was 1997. Yeah. Uh, this one my... is only black and white because we send the original ones to um, uh, to the, the recipients, but that was, what ground is West, that? West Ham. That was West Ham. Mm -hmm. So um, I think at some stage, yeah, Charlie's got um, a few of pictures that Chris has done, but to say we, we don't keep the originals, we send them, make them into cards and send them to our friends. Um, mm -hmm. But um, so the um, the Brentford one, the, the guy at the front is, is Chris's friend who he goes to football with, so he will enjoy receiving that in September. He doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but um, we we do other other creative things. Um, well, I, I was thinking we we don't do art very much, really. But normally in the winter we do we do more. But, but we do do a lot of walk walking, um, not when and, it's and poetry yeah. as well. You had mentioned it's what, it's what? poetry as well. You had mentioned which poetry. I think a lot of people yeah. might find counterintuitive for. Um, people living in this situation but yeah it's, I love hearing you talk about poetry yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the poetry um, I'd, I'd always thought uh, I, I, sh I should really get into poetry and I, I had loads of poems that I'd, I'd got from um, quite, a, quite a lot of them we chat Charity. Char charity shops. I, I, I must. I must have had fifteen or twenty, um, but I, ne I never. I never really did it um, until um, when I when I was. Um, Speech oh, it was yeah. It was a, a fe fe ther therapist. Speech therapist um, told me how about. Uh, a patient who read the newspaper out, out loud every day. I thought this was too depressing, so I started reading Andrea a poem, a poem every day, and I and I do it every day, every morning, every morning. But we find that it helps his dictation and his speech and often we don't understand the poems and so it creates a discussion which again helps Chris to have a conversation. Um, he puts aside one poem that's it's a new, very short one I'm aware that we're running out of time so um, oh, yeah. so just read the other one. Yeah. So he's got a very very short poem that he's going to read. It's not, no, no, it's not. It's not um... Which one is it? It's a funny one. <laughs> bloody men. Bloody men are like bloody buses. You wait for about a year, and as soon as one approaches your stop, two or three others appear. You look at them flashing their indicators, offering you a ride. You're trying to read the destinations. You haven't much time to decide. If you make a mistake, there is no turning back. Jump off and you'll stand there and gaze while the cars and the taxis and lorries go by and the minutes, the hours, the days. That's yeah. Wendy Cope. Beautiful. Thank you very I, I think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I love that, and very well read as well. I, I thought you. Well, I, 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 I can I can read perfectly well, but uh, it's it's getting what what's in there. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, it's really lovely to speak to you again, and um, yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. And um, yeah, okay. look forward to hearing some more. I'm sure I've seen lots of. Um, lovely comments coming in through the chat box as well. So I, I think there, there's lots of interest um, in that, and you're, there'll be more to talk about in the panel discussion, no doubt. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. Thank you.
wonderful thanks, thanks chris and andrea so much for sharing really 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 kind of you and some wonderful ideas there um so next uh we're going to be turning to a short conversation um between uh charlie tony and rebecca who just joined us lovely to see you tony and rebecca thank you for coming um and i guess a little bit of background for this is to say that um red Match support like many if not hopefully all organizations is really conscious of how difficult sometimes it is for people with rarer dementias or other other potential users of those services support services um, to reach the services in the first place um, and of course that's partly because of the rarity um, of these um, diagnoses and people's general lack of familiarity both in the public but also in the professional realm with some of these conditions um, but also because of other factors that might limit people's access and inclusion um, in services people's ethnicity, the socioeconomic position, where they live, different types of stigma and misconceptions, particularly around what, what dementia is um, and assumptions people have made about them before they ever get their voice heard in the conversation. And we're very interested in, in different approaches to work around equality and diversity and inclusion. For us, as I hope is uh, clear from Charlie's wonderful conversations um, so far, is very much wanting to put lived experience um, and the voices of people who actually really know what it's like to live with these conditions front and center so for example with a lot of our outreach work um, um very generous members of our rare dementia support community whether with a diagnosis themselves or caring for someone who has are out in the community faith groups community groups professional organizations right around the country trying to essentially get people to ask a really basic question encourage them to say every time you hear the word dementia to ask yourself what type just to try and raise and deepen we've got very broad awareness of dementia now and now we need slightly deeper um, awareness and understanding of how these different conditions can uh, materially emotionally spiritually and in other ways aff socially affect people in so many different ways um and so it's really um, with with that interest, that that um, set of values, that um, it's been really great to hear about some of the um, relationship that uh, Charlie has building, been building with um, Tony and Rebecca and their organisation Sweet Patootie Arts over the last couple of years. And, and through this partnership, really to understand how knowledge can be exchanged um, between different community groups and art venues and football clubs and dementia networks and uh, you guys will tell us all about it um, but particularly learning from the experience of um, people in the Black British Caribbean uh, community and the people with that heritage um, so if I, it's okay to hand over to, to you guys to, to use your voices to share a little bit about what you're doing and the relationship that's been growing that'd be really helpful. Yeah, and I, I can just very like briefly introduce just to say that yeah, Tony and Becca are creators of in incredible heritage work that have been working in this area for a long time, um, and are really experienced in working in the community and connecting with people and organisations. Um, and you're currently touring a film called Turning Point, which is such an amazing film. It, it, it's um, four four short films, in fact, inspired by the oral histories of um, Black Caribbean experience after the First World War. Um, so yeah, I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about the that that project and how it connects with your heritage work. So, a lot of work doing historical research, and because of Tony's Caribbean background, we ended up doing some TV museum interpretation, and it was all sort of factual work and a lot of connection with the community because of the type of stories that we were wanting to tell. So we were sort of looking at that, I suppose, Britain's colonial heritage. And so that's the sort of context that we've built on since the 90s. Um, and Turning Point has, I suppose, I don't know, we, we became experts in that, but we've got an art background and we wanted to revisit our art background and Tony had been doing quite a lot of writing so more dramatic writing and started to use a lot of the information that people had told us about that period sort of first world war period and then after the first world war and 
that's where Turning Point, that's the, the stories are set in Jamaica and Barbados in the 1920s and an emergence really of more sort of black pride, I think. And um, there are four stories, two women, two men, and some of it's quite serious, but also we wanted to bring in comedy and melodrama. We wanted, each one is 10 minutes long, and we wanted to combine that theatrical, you know, a performer giving a monologue, but we wanted that performer to be responding to voices. Mm. And we also wanted visual. We wanted something that was quite immersive, that we thought, right, it would work really well in a gallery situation where it played on loop, where people could come and go and the sound would be important, but the visuals and the story. Mm. And, um, but it has flexibility. It can be watched on a laptop as well. Yeah. Uh, it, I don't know, I, I was just thinking, so, the sound is really important because I think there are lots of aspects of it because of the Caribbean, the Jamaican and Barbados dialect that's used. So we have subtitles, but for people from mm. Caribbean communities, they fed back to us, you know, actually being able to hear dialects and idioms and the, their connections with that, but also the sounds as well, whether it's birds or cane, mm. wind in the cane, sea, lots of, there are lots of things that are very evocative. Mm. And I think when we started making it, it was, I think Helena was saying that thing about what we were trying to do was make something that Helena was saying about going to the summer exhibition and seeing seeing other things, how it can spark ideas for yourself to be creative. So mm. the idea is, I suppose, for people to be able to go and enjoy it as it is, but also hopefully going forward, we'll actually be able to work with partners to mm. have workshops where people can watch Turning Point or maybe just one story from Turning Point and use that as a catalyst mm. for their own creativity. It's really, really interesting. And I, I suppose that that brings kind of like where that sort of interest and connection is, is you, you approached us because our, our interest is obviously around rare dementias um, and not just rare dementias, but more broadly as well. Some, some of the resources and services that are available for people from min minoritized groups aren't particularly appropriate and they don't like um, serve the needs of these different communities. And so Another way that art can be really powerful, I think, is that through artwork such as a turning point film, that can sort of be used as part of that sort of like resource toolkit that we might be able to sort of share and connect with people. And and it's, you know, the, the difference between someone like myself going into a community centre and talking about posterior cortical atrophy or primary progressive aphasia, um, it's, it's not a very like sort of um, useful start to the conversation, whereas entering into a situation where we're able to sort of show aspects of your film, connect with people's heritage, really important parts of people's like history, um, and then introduce the idea that, you know, that this, every community centre that we've been to um, with this, people always say, oh yeah, someone in our group's got a challenges with language or challenges with vision. Um, and, and so it's sort of building that trust and those connections, I think, um, through that work, is, it, it's, it's so important. Um, and yeah, so the time is flying by a little bit, and I think um, it'll be really nice because I think part part of this this conversation is very much about sort of making connections and being in the community, and that that really relates very closely to some of the sort of broader social prescribing um, agenda in the in the UK at the moment as well. And so I don't know whether I think Seb's going to sort of come in with Monica a little bit to um, sort of see how these things might relate. I am, but I'm greedily going to steal back a little bit of time, if that's okay, from our chat later on, just to ask um, Tony and Rebecca before I do that. 
one of the things that's been so helpful for, for us as Red Image support in our learning is that our premise is always is often that people are quite feel quite isolated because they've been given a, a rare dementia diagnosis and they've never met anyone else in the similar situation. So our role is to connect people, create, give them, help them find a sense of community. What we've learned so much about from your work is is that the other pattern is also very much true that if you can reach people by connecting them with a, a community they're already part of and keeping them connected, then out of that relationship, we might then meet people with these different forms of dementia where that support. So as, as Charlie says, not putting the diagnosis first, but putting the person first and the exist and building from an existing relationship. And I just wondered how how easy or difficult you found it to work in that way, because it, it's certainly the opposite of our practice. I, I think that um, there's it, it, it would be a um, complete lie to say that it was easy because we, we have to work with um, uh, support networks and so all of those things have to be put in place. But on the other hand, um, our, ours is what we call a participatory practice. And we've involved um, participatory ways of working over 20 odd years and more, really, of um, developing projects, um, identifying contributors, developing support networks when we work with contributors, developing story and so on. And Turning Point is, is in many ways an evolution of a lot of those lessons that we've learned. So there are different examples of where we touched on those things. So, um, like, for example, the amazing day when um, we needed to know whether the humour was working. And we went to um, uh, the lovely uh, day centre, not too far away from where we're based in London, Islington, in Hackney, Hackney Caribbean Elders. Um, they just dropped us in the deep end. They said, it's going to be lunch in 20 minutes, half an hour. Everyone is here at the moment in the day room. Have at it. And uh, we'd recorded little bits of our um, rehearsal tapes, uh, with our rehearsal, sorry, on our phones, and downloaded that onto the computer, played back the computer to little groups of people some of whom, and we didn't know, were people who were living with dementias of one form or another. Yeah, so see, yeah, that's what see. But there were people who came yeah. into the moment yeah. in a wow. very, very big way. And so much so that the support worker, um, who you met, Charlie, when we were showing, yeah. um, they, they were just... More than us, because we didn't go in there with 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 a methodology and an intent to try and provoke work with these people. I think it's the phrase used before, it really, really came by accident. But we had a sense that there was the potential for and the need to um, be sensitive to the ways we needed to enable people who might be living with dementias to work with us. Mm. This, this session at the Hackney Caribbean Elders, the upshot is that um, some of those people, they they worked with us on the um, the sessions about the humour and the humour did work and got thumbs up. Um, they uh, gave us fantastic crit about other aspects of the stories and they also uh, participated in building the sound design that Beck was talking about. They recorded for us as well. They all came into the moment and the centre manager and the other staff, they saw ways that they could be um, developing work with us and we're going to be following that up. And I believe that, uh, that they want to follow that up with you as well, Charlie, as well. So mm -hmm. these things are doable and possible, but the structures had to be put in place in order for them to work. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. You just make a flash and then it goes. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Tony. That's really helpful. And that, that theme of sustainability is one we'll come back to in the 
conversation in a minute. If you don't mind staying on screen, um, I was just going to bring uh, Monica in to join us. Monica, thanks so much for being with us today. I wondered if you could just briefly tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your role. Um, and in particular, we've mentioned several people in the conversation so far. I've mentioned social prescribing. So maybe you could give us your personal uh, definition of what that means to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's really great to be here. I'm um, already feeling inspired, so looking forward to continuing this um, conversation. So yeah, I'm Monica Bolton. I work for the National Academy for Social Prescribing. I'm their healthcare integration lead. I've had a background in uh, uh, an interest in creative health and uh, really particularly around music, supporting people with dementia. Um, and I think the essence of social prescribing has re already been beautifully captured throughout much of the conversation that we've been having. Um, but just to kind of put my spin on it, I guess, um, social prescribing is largely um, a holistic and very person-centered and community-based approach to, to health and well-being, And it kind of bridges the gap between clinical and non-clinical support services um, I guess the, the the essence of it is is that um, it's a way of connecting people to services, activities, support, their local community essentially um, that that all kind of have benefits and 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 um, aid improvements in people's health and well being. Um, social prescribing has um, and, and similar approaches as well have been practiced in the NHS for for years and years and years. Um, but the NHS long term plan that was released back in 2019 marked a real shift because social prescribing was incorporated into the comprehensive model of um, personalised care. Um, and since then, around, um, I think it's just shy of 4,000, something like 3,500 link workers have been recruited directly into the NHS. Um, and the social prescribing movement has been explored, recognised, adopted all over the world, um, whilst continuing to sort of gather momentum within research. Um, academia and um, in fact Mar Mar Marcello Barotti is just about to release the textbook <laughs> um, which I'm sure will kind of capture case studies um, that demonstrate the fact that there are a multitude of ways in which patients can connect to varying social prescribing services in England uh, you know across across the world so um, yeah hopefully that gives a good enough summary because it's very difficult to capture in, in a short space of time <laughs> that's brilliant but it's really affirming to hear that many of the things you've heard already in the conversation sort of share the essence of, of social prescribing for those of us just to make things a bit more practical for those of us either with a lived experience or a professional background who don't feel they've kind of explicitly or knowingly connected with um social prescribing practice before i wonder if you could just say about how how that happens and, mm -hmm. and also what people might expect from a conversation with one of the link workers that you refer to yeah, I think it's I think it's probably um, important to highlight here that social prescribing is not intended to ever replace or kind of undermine medicine, but to kind of complement and work alongside it. The main ethos of social prescribing, as I say, is encouraging it to be person centred and, and all built around this what matters to me conversation. Um, in England, social prescribing link workers are predominantly embedded within primary care networks, so your GP practice, meaning that healthcare professionals or other professionals in that primary care network who have identified perhaps a psychosocial issue can make direct referrals into that social prescribing service. There are some social prescribing services that enable referrals from other professionals, such as, um, I don't know, your fire service, your social services, care coordinators, you know, people like that. Um, but the first thing that I would suggest if you're looking to find your local social prescribing service, whether you're somebody in need of support or perhaps a, a creative organisation looking to connect, would be to kind of look on your GP or PCM website and hopefully the social prescribing details um, are logged there. Um, to summarise, I guess, what the journey looks like once you've been referred into social prescribing, which I think is probably the most helpful way to describe what social prescribing is, um, it's quite difficult to capture, as I say, in the time that we've got here. But one, once a referral has been made to that link worker, um, Charlie mentioned it earlier in terms of the fast paceness and, and I guess in contrast to that 10 minute appointment that we get with our GP, the link worker will spend up to an hour, sometimes more, using their expert skills and techniques such as motivational interviewing, behaviour change techniques to get to, as I say, really know what matters to that individual, what their interests are, what priorities they might have, what brings them that real sense of purpose and aspects of their well-being that they might want to improve. And then through the connections that they've made with their local community, they can kind of identify the services that are available to that person, of course, including creative and cultural activities and explore the barriers that there are to accessing those, those groups and services and then be the bridge, if you like, um, empowering that, that person to engage with that onward referral. Um, the involvement can be anything from two weeks to six months. It's, it's very client led. Um, and of course, health and well-being is ongoing and, and changeable, as we all know. And so sometimes link workers might see somebody 
more than once um, over a six month period or even longer than that. Um, and I think it's it's um, bringing it back to the kind of dementia side of things. It's it's important to recognize that social prescribing can be relevant at any stage of a condition, including dementia. So it could be pre-diagnosis and also not just relevant for the, the patient, the person I like to say, rather than patient, but, but also for the caregivers, the wider family too, as they navigate that world kind of pre and post diagnosis. That's fantastic. Thank you. Really brief and but comprehensive summary. Thank you. Um, just as we um welcome um Helena and David and Chris and Andrew back onto the screen for a few sort of questions between us, and do please feel free to ask questions of each other. I just wanted to pick up on that final point you made, uh, Monica, about the different stages, which links in with Tony's point. I think about continuity as well, because there's continuity for the organisations, fantastic organisations like Sweet Patuti, who are offering fantastic cultural opportunities and, and the different arts organisations that Helen and David and Chris and Andrea were talking about. Um, but there's also continuity for the person um, living with the condition or caring for and about that person as, as things change, because sadly these are progressive conditions. And I remember David um, mentioning that in describing one of the activities um, that they'd been part of, I think it was Wigmore Hall, you said that was just at the stage where, where you're in that immediate post-diagnostic diagnostic grief phase so presumably the link workers in directing people towards opportunities but also Tony Beck you and Charlie and others in responding to the people you're meeting have to be operating you have to be very nimble and on your toes and responding to people not just different people but different and diff not just different diseases but different people with different diseases at different stages or facing different challenges how does that look it sounds like a, a wonderful the link worker world sounds like a wonderful but very daunting world yeah i mean it's link workers are kind of a bit of the kind of lack of all jack of all trades i guess <laughs> master of none and um it is really about getting to know that local community and the time that they've got to kind of get to know the person i think that like it it's kind of um, a really exciting way of embedding creativity at the start of somebody's journey. Um, so once symptoms first appear and it can kind of contribute of that like conversation to be right at the very like beginning of somebody's journey. I think it would be great to see a world where referrals to social prescribing kind of become the norm as discussions are had around potentially life-changing conditions because then if it's embedded at that early stage it's then more likely to be incorporated in the later kind of stages as well also for the family um, and I think it also just starts that conversation of of what non-medical interventions can also do and by embedding with that community you've then got that more kind of sustained Kind of care but obviously that then is reliant on the sustainability of organizations which tony kind of touched on um, and that's why it's really important that social prescribing is that kind of not just seen as the isolation of the role and why it really helps to kind of like i say bridge that gap between the community and healthcare to make sure that those two things are in sync with one another um hopefully that answers your question yeah it does very very comprehensive i don't know if anyone else has any comments on that so about either how you um find the right thing at the right time um, or for Tony and Charlie how you adapt um, to the different needs that people are facing at different stages in their condition for me in practical terms it, it it's about building trust really in relationships um, we've got uh, we've essentially permanently got um, relationships with people who are gatekeepers in communities and also um, family and community social services. Um, so um, some relationships they they kind of like call, cool, but we 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 um, have a, 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 a basic function of maintaining them all the time. And that's a huge drain on resources. But in terms of project delivery, it's because we have those relationships, we have uh, the opportunities of being well informed when we take an opportunity somewhere. Um, we're not coming with a, an expectation that one strategy, one approach will fit everybody. It be, does become person centered mm. and the needs, whether it's more time or um, 
whatever but the the, the needs are, are understood and uh, um, the sessions are structured basically and then they become appropriate hmm. but um that is a really it, it's a crucial thing there's no um there's no easy solution to the demands that it makes on us as an organization it's the way that we choose to work but it it does take an awful lot of our time to maintain those relationships on the other hand and uh, the proof of the pudding i think is in the the enjoyment um of those sessions because we all enjoy them we all do but also as well the work that comes out of it and um, then the opportunities to share the work with the public and the feedback that comes as well um, everybody seems to be having a good time and it's a model that does that really really does work mm. but this... and that, that, that good time really it seems echoed in Helena and David and Chris and Andrea in your experiences of, of the groups and opportunities and activities you've been part of um, but Tony just there was stressing the importance of trust and also the challenge of of sustainability of, of maintaining those relationships i was curious as to know um in terms of trust and sustainability how easy or difficult had you found it because presumably some of the activities and relationships you've built up have been for for a fixed time activities that have begun and had a had an end date is that right and how does it feel when things come to an end or opportunities um, can't continue well i mean I think things like, um, you know, in the early days in lockdown, when there wasn't much going on, then there was a sense of loss, you know, at the end of something that had been good. Yeah. And um, there was some other, um, there was an early on, there was a, a bit of small, uh, uh, some um, Queen Square research into small groups that RDS were doing, how it was involved in. And that was another thing which was, um, you know, sort of real high point of the week to have that sort of contact, and then it you, it, you, it ends and it, and it is it's sort of a bit devastating. Now that was all exacerbated by it being in lockdown and there not being much else. And uh, you know, now um, there's Helen's got a lot on um, uh, a lot of. I mean, she's only until just recently stopped volunteering as a befriender at the local food bank. Um, as another sort of connection and uh, um, and I think all of the things that in the end have worked for you are where you've um, you found that connection with the people and the trust of the people yeah. and feeling safe I mean in the end mm. that, that, that's the key isn't it is that uh, it's, um, it's, it's it's very difficult if you were going into a situation where you were not feeling that the other people that you were work with were looking out for you, then it rapidly becomes yeah. a much other. Okay. Well, I mean, the choir works really well because yeah, it's, such a, it. it's such an embracive, um, it, you know, it, 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 it embracing group of people who, who've just got lots of time and lots of um, willingness to accept everybody as they are and, um, uh, and to yeah, make it work. You know, that's that's mm -hmm. the thing. I mean, it's a it's a lovely um, setup, really, and, and it's um, it's very much it's, it comes from a um, uh, the lady who runs it. It's come from a you know, it's her it's her sort of um, calling almost to to do this. Uh, you know, she was involved in schools and and, um, and things previously, but I think that. Uh, um, so there's, there's creating, nations. Creating, yeah. creating a community that is not just about singing it's about the community as well you know mm -hmm. and uh, and to let anybody be part of that you know it's it's um it, it's called sing well so um, yeah, yeah it's, it's sort of um yes and i mean I, I sing in a chamber choir which is tries to do everything very properly and it's all quite high pressure and the difference in the um, in the well-being that, that we get from our different choral activities is is quite stark. You know, I get lots of well-being from from the uh, the music. You know, how I get best there's the music. There's the sort of being singing with people is great, um, but there's um, so much more time in 
the community choir for it to be more than just the music. You know, that's that's a key thing. And I think the same at, at your art group as mm -hmm. well. Um, you're always talking about all sorts of things, and yes. it's a very wide, yeah. Yeah. Sort of general, safe environment for um, uh, for, for talking about life, the world, and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, and it, it feels like so often people, for example, we haven't talked about dance, for example, today, but people often talk about dance as being like the holy trinity of its it's cognitive. You have to think about it. It's physical, but it's it, it, critically, it's also social as well. Um, so yeah, yeah but, and 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 Rebecca was talking powerfully about the different components. These very immersive experiences, not just the vision, but the stories and the sound. And that's something that we notice being offers that are particularly well received by broader members of our Red Image support community because people will have different um, access needs. And so those really rich experiences mean they have that kind of element of something for everyone. Um, really Can I just to... come in on the um, sustainability Please, point? Um, and I don't think it's just re relative to social prescribing, but creative health more broadly, is that I think that there's we've still got quite a long way to go in terms of not boxing who fits the the mould for who these creative activities can be can benefit. And actually that it goes right from the, the whole spectrum of somewhere, someone's kind of healthcare journey and the appreciation of that can perhaps lead to more sustainability um, in, in some of these things, which are often quite short term. And we see it as relevant to and just as important in somebody's kind of healthcare journey um, as the medicine itself and, and and therefore it needs to be sustained um, and more widely available so I think there's more learning that we can do on those benefits to then encourage that sustainability um, culture and, uh, change as well I think <laughs> just, just in relation to that sustainability point as well and uh, you'll have to excuse me a little bit just for a bit of a plug of um, the way Seb's very <laughs> We've been working very hard and others at RDS about bringing about the world's first rare dementia support centre um, and so much of what we've been thinking about here today has been around how we can sort of maintain and create a, a sort of cultural space for people as well because I think when people are coming into clinic and doing those other things you also want a space where um, people feel welcome and at home as well and and uh, you know London's a very busy place to come to um, <coughs> and so lots of what we're thinking about is around you know having a, a base where we can sort of um, sort of express all of this stuff from our perspective and yeah I, I, it's always been a bit of a question with our work is that you, you want to help everybody mm -hmm. and there's so we have so many thousands of members but you know the 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 work of other groups, as we've heard today, is so important for people to connect with in their own community. We can't run every group in every community. And so it's really important that, you know, that people are talking to each other and different organisations are talking to each other. Completely agree, Charlie. And that's where those relationships you talk about are so complementary. With, you know, I know that we've, we've met lots of different people through Tony, our relationship with Tony and Beck as well around, around the UK because we're trying to be a service for everyone. Um, I'm conscious of time moving on and keen to invite our Italian colleagues to join us in a moment. But one one quick question that came in um, that Chris and Andrea may have a view on, um, but also a question for you, Monica, um, was about how easy it is to find activities. So the notion of a conversation with a link web might be very encouraging and empowering, but that actual joining up and the question from Tim in the audience was about whether there's anything more needed to bridge the gap to provide is that's not there at the at present um so just before you ask answer that monica i just wanted chris and andrea just to ask you how easy or difficult you'd found it um to find the kind of opportunities that you were talking about with charlie earlier well very difficult really um it's, it's hard work um to um because of chris's specific type of ppa um being in groups of people is very difficult um, even on our social network, uh, we stopped um, mixing with large groups of people. We tend to go out to dinner with just four of us rather than six or eight of us because um, the more people there are around, then the more difficult it is for Chris to, to feel part of that organisation. Um, uh, and it's the same with, um, you know, going anywhere really whether it's an art group or any any sort of group activity because um because of that particular di um, aphasia then it's it's really difficult for him to become and feel part of a group 
Um, we, we recently set up um, uh, a Sussex, a West Sussex uh, PPA group. This has been done through UCL. Uh, we've got our second meeting next week and, and on our agenda is going to be that sort of thing is how can we meet, um, make everybody with specific types of L, um, primary progressive aphasia um, to be part of a community that is going to work for them. Uh, at the moment, I think it's very difficult, um, you know, which is why Chris enjoys doing art and poetry, um, walking, cooking. It seems that he can, do, own. He can do all the <laughs> stuff without, without having to talk because that's his difficulty. Yeah. Uh, but there must be a gap somewhere that we can fill. Thank you. That's really helpful. So, Monica, if it's okay to just come to you for the final word. Um, yeah, I've just read through the um, the the question in the chat, and um, I used to be a link worker, so remember the difficulties of there constantly being gaps out there in terms of provision um, and what's available. Um, and so, the simple answer is no. There's not enough funding. There's not enough groups out there. Um, link workers have to work incredibly closely with the voluntary sector, and I think there's there is a real shift of you know healthcare and voluntary sector and local authorities working closely more closely together. But I think we've still got a really long way to go, um, and I think that's why it's useful to see social prescribing beyond the link worker role. The link worker role is at the heart of it, but actually actually in the context of a system and what is the infrastructure that's needed to actually enable that system to work smoothly and um, so there's there's a lot more to say I guess on that but I think one thing to highlight is the data that can potentially be drawn down through the the um the the people that social prescribing are seeing and what the needs actually are rather than the reason why they're referred um can go a long way to then evidencing what's needed and then could hopefully bring down some funding that's the kind of blue sky world thinking I guess um but that's the work that we're developing at NASP and we've got offers for ICS integrated care systems and primary care networks to kind of support that way of thinking a little bit more and really work in that very integrated way so short answer is no there's not enough um, but I think we're on the journey to, to, to enabling a better richer provision. Great well thank you so much for summarising that and um, let's open those ongoing conversations it can be not just about yeah as you say not just about uh, fixing the funding gap but also about seeing how things like what Tony mentioned about trust being embedded with at the heart of those systems um, uh, and sustainable relationships um, it'd be great to see over the next few years huge huge thank you again to Helena to David to Chris to Andrea uh, to Tony to Rebecca to Monica and also very much so to Charlie for being such a big part of the conversation this afternoon we're incredibly grateful to you all and I know um, if the audience were able to, that they would be um, whooping, clapping, hollering, and um, uh, expressing their, their appreciation of all your contributions very much. So thank you so much for your time. And people will be able to re-experience this, I think, with the recording and transcript that Veronica will send around after the event. But for now, um, thank you. Um, and we're going to hand over um, to our wonderful Italian colleagues, uh, Christian and Eloisa. Um, uh, Christian Eloisa, I think you are there. You certainly were a moment ago on my screen. Um, we are. We're we here. are. Great. And we've got Frank and Fanny. And I yes. think um, Tatiana is there as well. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much all for being here. And um, because of my absolutely abysmal and non-existent language skills, I'm, I have to <laughs> confess to the rest of our audience that I'm going to be handing over to you uh, to chair the rest of the session before Veronica closes it out. But just before I do, I just wondered, Eloise and, and Christian, whether you could introduce yourselves um, and say a little bit about okay. your, your practice in Padua. It'd be lovely to hear about that. So if you don't mind, uh, I'll be sharing some slides also because maybe my pronunciation is not the best. And so it, it, I make it as, you know, easy as possible to understand us. Okay. Uh, I, I use this picture, maybe, I don't know if you see it, but uh, it's a beautiful yeah, picture. Well, with, with the um, so we are a non-profit organization based in Parma in northern Italy and uh, since the very beginning, which was in 2014, this year we celebrate our 10th anniversary, uh, we always insisted in uh, promoting the voices and perspectives of people living with dementia because we, um, we understood that most of the stigma and the prejudice that is around this condition 
uh, is strictly associated to the fact that people with dementia, living with dementia, especially in Italy, nobody see them. They are quite invisible. And um, and so we, we're doing our best to promote their point of view and uh, to enable them to live a life as beautiful and full as possible. Uh, and we do this with, uh, well, the, here we there is a, a group of, of us. This is uh, actually a part of the community that is actually working uh, actively on our uh, activities. And, uh, but basically most of the activities um, are associated to peer support, which is another core activity for most of whatever we design uh, together with people living with dementia and their families. So we organize peer-to-peer -peer, uh, groups, both online and on site. We also have a group uh, for people living with communication impairments. Last year, and this, this is what we will be talking about with uh, Tiziano, uh, we started to organize activities focusing on social tourism, arts and culture and social participation in order to uh, give the opportunity not only to just see the beauty around us, but also to reappropriate our community. So to fight against that invisibility that is... Um, very common here in Italy for people living with dementia. We are also investing in a lot of energies in advocacy, both inside the, inside the associ association, and we also train other organizations here in Italy uh, to take up advocacy for people living with dementia, because uh, we know that it's uh, the, the way to uh, promote the rights and point of view. And... Um, Christian also is um, organizing uh, courses and training uh, opportunities for improving, to improve digital literacy for people living with dementia. And usually he also involves uh, family caregivers so that they can work together so that people living with dementia can keep working using their phones, their smartphones, Alexa, and whatever digital technology uh, is available so that they can maintain their full autonomy for uh, as long as possible. And of course, we also have a helpline for people with dementia and their families. Now, I collected a few pictures of our uh, tours last year. Uh, these are mostly based, these places are mostly based in Padua. So we have Palazzo Bo, where Galileo uh, used to teach. Uh, we went to see an exhibition of Frida Kahlo. We went to the bot botanical park. Drive anymore, but he used to be a Halitzevitzon biker, serious biker, obviously. Um, he lives nearby Padua, and uh, he's a part of uh, our uh, peer support group. Uh, actually, two peer support groups uh, here in uh, in Padua with us, and uh, he lives with the uh, early onset Alzheimer's because he received his um, uh, diagnosis when he was sixty two. Uh, but um, he also knows very well uh, Alzheimer's because he, he used to care, uh, be a, the, care, the primary caregiver for his mother. Um, he does a lot of things for us as an advocate, so we start to involve him in, uh, in our training for professionals so that they can have the professionals, you know, uh, usually professionals who work in um, nursing homes or even in the community, they have the opportunity to talk with the person with dementia, like a peer, you know, uh, in order to understand a little bit better the, the needs or the points of view, because usually they take for granted that they know everything. Uh, and that's rarely the case because, you know, we're all so different. Um, so uh, we asked Tiziano to, to talk with us today because he was part of our uh, art and culture group. And so I asked him to, to tell us about his perspective, what he, how he, he lived that uh, experience. 
So, Tiziano, eh, ci puoi parlare di, di che, cosa, che cosa è stato per te l'esperienza di vedere un po' di musei, di vedere un po' di Padova e Chioggia? Cosa ti è piaciuto? Eh, 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 per, eh, per me è una cosa molto molto buona perché mi piace l'arte e per cui eh, vedere eh, questi che hanno ha fatto... Prima la LOD, eh, sì, vabbè, ok. Um, eh. intanto, intanto traduco questa cosa, sai, aspetta, he, Tiziano just said he loved the activities because he, he's, he loves arts, so he, he had the opportunity to see beautiful uh, artistic venues uh, in the city. E poi mi hai detto che ci sono delle, 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 dei luoghi che ti sono piaciuti in particolare. So there were particular places that... no, ma quelle, che, quelle, quelle che abbiamo annunciato prima sono le cose più belle che, che abbiamo visto, ma però uh, quello che, che, che mi piace vedere no? che e, attraverso i, 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 gli altri persone che lavorano cioè che vivono con noi con que sì. queste um, uh, queste um, uh, queste disagio uh, uh, si vede che quando andiamo fuori andiamo a, a, a trovare uh, a vedere le, queste cose queste bellezze sì. uh, è, è la cosa molto 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 bella e quello che, che mi fa stare bene è che quando usciamo da queste da, da queste questi gite diciamo sì. così ecco è così e, e sono tutti quanti che ha, sono e, e, il sorriso sulla sulla faccia e che sì sì, 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 eh, eh, sono, sono felici, sono questo. felici. Sono felici, sì, sono felici. Allora, fammi tradurre questa parte. So, Tiziano said, I, I actually like, like all of them, all of the activities in particular. I know that he liked, um, he told me earlier that he liked especially Scrovegni and the Botanical Garden and, of course, Palazzo Bo. Uh, but he he's also said that the part that he likes the most when we do these um, visits is actually seeing the the faces of people living with dementia and their families happy. They he enjoys seeing their smiling and happy and enjoying the good time together with our community. That's the best part of uh, of the experience. Sì, Tiziano, quindi ti piace vedere le, le persone che, che godono, insomma, che se la godono un po', no? che stanno bene insieme. Esatto, esatto. esatto. Okay. Eh, la, posso andare avanti? L'ultima domanda, sì, sì, l'ultima cosa che vuoi dire. Vediamo. Eh, no, parlavo che oltre all'arte ci, ci, ci uh, facciamo queste eh uh, uscite, che è quelle che, per esempio, per andare a... A, vedere, a fare una gita sul, sul mare, sulla piccola eh, Venezia, dove sì. con me abbiamo fatto una bella eh, scampata. Mangiato. Eh? Come? Mangiato ma, bene. Ma è, mangiato mangiato bene. Stato, ma è stato molto molto bene con, con le persone. C'è stata una giornata speciale. Sì, ok. Dai, lo traduco e grazie Tiziano intanto. So uh, he said that, of course, every, every time we meet, every time we, we go for a visit, we also include, uh, at, the, at the end of the visit, we also include a time to have some food. Of course, we're Italian, so the stereotype, the stereotype is very much real. Some, uh, you know, some good time with, the, with a glass of wine or a coffee or, uh, or some pasta. And, uh, and actually at the end of the first part of the program, which was at the end of uh, actually beginning of July of last year, we went to Chioggia, which is a very small village close by Venice. And um, 
they call it the small Venice because it looks like Venice, but it's a little bit more run down and, uh, and uh, it's the underdog of Venice, basically. But um, we had a, a fantastic time together because there was the sun and the sea. And of course, we ate a lot of fish and fried fish and everything else. It was really, really good. And in fact, the, the first picture that you saw in our presentation was taken in uh, in Chioggia. So thank you. Grazie. Grazie Tiziano. And now uh, I will pass along. Grazie. Thank you. Um, I will pass along to my colleague Christian. He's the vice president of uh, Novilunio. Yes, thank you very much. Can you make the projection of the slides? Of course. Uh, my first uh, uh, thing is that I want to say a real thank you to Chris and Helen that we saw before because I'm a speech language therapist and I saw that uh, they were participating and talking. I love it. And because it's, uh, it's nice to see uh, if there are any kind of uh, communication uh, problem that people are, are trying, are doing, and saying what they need to say and not uh, uh, only what the caregivers say, for example. So that's uh, something that uh, I really like. It. And thank you very much for uh, participating also in this. So my next uh, thing is uh, another uh, thing that I want to say about uh, Noviluni, but I will be really, really fast and furious, uh, <laughs> that we have this kind of activities. Uh, and uh, one of the keyword is empowerment. So the idea is... Uh, that uh, the people that are participating in this, uh, uh, this group, as uh, Tiziano was saying before, is nice because uh, they arrived. It's like a group of friends that are meeting, gathering, uh, drinking coffee, laughing. <laughs> and the, the, the meeting uh, usually to start at half past 10 and finish at 12. And we started uh, usually at 10 and we finish at 1 p.m. because uh, nobody wants to leave. And we are there talking, chatting, discussing, and trying to find out solution. And, and the first thing that we are doing is to improve our quality of life of all of us. And that's very nice because we are there and we are discussing. And everybody can say what they really need to say. There is no one that is, oh, okay, this is stupid, this is an idiot, that's something that you have not to say. You can say whatever you want. And that's very, very nice because we are there all together. And we are separate, sorry for the caregivers, but we are separate from the caregivers. So in our group, there are only people uh, with the diagnosis, with the, uh, dementia, every kind of dementia because it's very heterogeneous in our group. We are there discussing, laughing, crying sometimes, and uh, sharing. So the inclusivity is another word that... Uh, I want to say, but that's uh, uh, that's enough from my side because uh, uh, something that I want to introduce instead is uh, our our special guest uh, that is uh, Francesco uh, Parisotto, and I will say a few words uh, about him because also Francesco is uh, is very very young, and then maybe uh, we'll say uh, how many. Uh, yeah, uh, say it. ah, it's a secret. Ah, it's a secret. Okay, oh, it's a, it's a, <laughs> but an, anyway, is a is a living with a calasil, so a rare form of genetic vascular dementia, and uh, is a really passionate advocate about that. Uh, he, he worked as a mechanic and sales consultant. He did a lots of stuff uh, about the civil protection association for twenty five years, so he was devoted. Uh, already to other people, and uh, also his mother suffered with uh, Cadacil, so he already know what does it mean, and uh, he lives uh, one hour far from Padua, so every time that uh, we meet, they are traveling uh, to Padua, and uh, they arrived usually with a lot of coffee, because <laughs> they, they are our special That's coffee a, machine, uh, picture. Yeah. Yeah. you can see in the picture that uh, that there was the coffee exactly. machine that we have in our association and uh, a lot of time. And uh, what, uh, uh, why uh, Frankie is here today? Because uh, he really like and love to write poems. So we already heard uh, before when we were talking about the importance also and then about uh, the poems. And uh, so he started the writing poems. He already wrote uh, 60 poems. So tonight, uh, special for you. <laughs> we will uh, have a reading 
from a Frank about uh, a choice of uh, one, maybe, or, or two. And uh, so uh, Veronica translated also uh, the poem yeah. in English, so uh, you can see in the next slide. And uh, I, I will ask uh, Francesco to read the first one in Italian, uh, so you can also uh, listen to his voice. And then uh, I will just have one question because the time is running. And uh, just to ask uh, one thing to Frank. But before that, please, Frank, can you read it? Ascoltami is the title. Sì. Ascoltami, perché non senti? <coughs> Io grido il mio dolore. Nessuno ascolta. Ascoltami. Sento a spadere la mia vita. Mille pezzi vagheranno, nessuno si poserà, nessuno si ricorderà. Ascoltami. Thank you, Francesco. As you can see from, uh, uh, from the, the translation, I think this uh, is fun, something that everybody, when is needing or some help, is uh, like uh, uh, asking uh, to all the world just to listen, but not just uh, uh, hearing, is really listening to something. So I'm crying. I'm saying that, that there is something that is not going well. So please listen to me, please. Nobody's listening. And that's something that uh, also in our groups we, we discuss uh, about, okay, uh, I have not uh, somebody to talk uh, really free about what I feel, what is inside. And this is something that they, that's why the group, because in the group, nobody's taking any kind of uh, attention to the word that you are using, if it's the right one. No, man, you have to say that. No, you have to do that. No, that's not important. So the listening uh, issue is very important. So my, my first question to, and, and the only question <laughs> to, <laughs> to Fr Frank is, uh, uh, what really means for you write poems? What, what tell me the the meaning from, for you, in Italian, and we will translate in some way. Eh, leggo una cosa che ho scritto, perché sennò dopo facevo... Yes. Che... <laughs> per me scrivere poesie è esternare i miei sentimenti, cercare di guarire l'anima, comunicare con le persone, cercando un po' di empatia. Voglio scrivere e parlare per sentirmi vivo. Voglio portare la mia esperienza e come affronto le difficoltà. Non voglio arrendermi. Voglio essere utile a chiunque si trovi ad affrontare come me una diagnosi di decadimento cognitivo. Perché diagnosi non vuol dire fine, ma cambiamento mm. e speranza nel futuro. Come i tasti di un pianoforte, basta toccare i tasti giusti. Quando uno suona un piano, può sbagliare i tasti o stonare perché i tasti non sono accordati. Ecco, questo succede anche a noi, persone con decadimento cognitivo. Basta toccare le parole giuste, i ricordi magari lontani, quei momenti a volte fuscati e tutto torna a colori. A volte la memoria fa cilecca, ma le emozioni rimangono e facendo leva su queste possiamo risvegliare i ricordi che sembravano persi o dimenticati, ma erano solo addormentati in attesa dei tasti giusti. Wow. Thank you very much, Frank. We will uh, we will send you all the words, but we I have summarized something for you now, uh, real now. But I will send to uh, Veronica that will uh, share with you all uh, this. But uh, in uh, real, in a nutshell, uh, what uh, Frank was saying is that uh, is uh, writing poems just to express the the feelings, and uh, and uh, this uh, for him is like uh, heal the soul. Communicate with people by seeking a bit of empathy. So he was talking about empathy a lot of time because uh, uh, one message that Frank is, is giving to all of us is that uh, never give up. Never give up because we have to fight. Actually, it's uh, the motto of the two of them. The yeah. beautiful lady <laughs> that you see right next to him, Fanny, is his wife. And I know that her motto is always never, never give up. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 but that, that's it. And, and another motto is like a diagnosis does not mean the end. It's a, a, a beginning of something else. It's a, a new kind of life, but it's something that you can also hope for a change. And that's another uh, thing that Frank was saying. 
And uh, I have also to say thank you to, to Frankie because in our group, uh, lots of time is speaking for uh, empowering all the other people saying, okay, you can do that. No worries, you can do that. No worries. <laughs> we, we, have, we are together, we can do something together. And that's something that we, we really like in, in the, the group. You also make a, a, yeah, a kind of, a, uh, it was saying, saying something about the piano, etc. We will write down all the, this uh, nice uh, figure that uh, he did. But uh, in other words, uh, I think that uh, sometimes, even if you have not the right words, even if you, have, you are not saying like uh, what you are thinking, but uh, in your soul, you really know what you are, what you want. And you can see from the people how they look at you, how they listen to you, how they are taking care of you, that it is an art behind. So we were discussing this also in the group uh, with some doctors, psychologists that are not uh, really sometimes listening to you, but just hearing things. So that's uh, for, for, from uh, our group. Uh, thank you very much, Frankie. And thank you very much, Fanny. And thank you very much, Tiziano, for, uh, for your to help and testimonial in this. I pass the word to the president. And a special thank you. <laughs> thank you to everybody. Thank you, Veronica, for inviting us. And yeah, okay. for sure. Thank you, Veronica. I met her in Naples and it was so nice. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you very much. It's ever more wonderful to see and hear you and to see all your. Uh, your members. Actually, I was going to say something in Italian. Grazie mille a Cristiana, Luisa, Tiziano e Frank. Uh, Grazie a voi, te. E voi poesie son, sono davvero audace e fonte di ispirazione per tutti noi. Wow! Thank you. <laughs> Inspirational. Thank you so much, Cristian e Luisa. Tiziano. Grazie a te. Grazie a te. That's it. Well, poetry is truly bold and inspirational. And I love to hear you say it empowers you to new adventures together. And I love all your smiles and you really uh, talking from your soul as indeed um, um, everything that uh, um, Seb and um, Charlie and um, Helena and um, all our speakers um been absolutely amazing and given really valuable insights into how despite each diagnostic challenge cultural and creative activity can make such a difference to life i actually should have said um uh chris and uh, andrea and helena and uh, david thank you so much helena particularly talked about when she, in preparing for this um, video today, speech to talk today, she absolutely came alive when she was talking about Rare Dementia Support's um, partnership with Out of the Ordinary at, um, at the Wigmore. And she was saying how fantastic it was to be offered that when they were facing the real trauma of the diagnosis and to be immediately offered this by Seb and his team really made an enormous difference to her. And um, uh, anyway, so I wanted to emphasize that. I know that they talked about it a bit, but it's a really amazing opportunity and anybody listening, um, you know, should take advantage if they can. Um, so in the chat, you will find links to rare dementia support and to this American study, how a rare dementia transforms patients into artists. This was research led by Adit Fried. Friedberg of the University of California in South San Francisco. Uh, they weren't able to join us, but it's on the brain changes that um, promote visual creativity. Um, uh, Monica has talked about the new policy uh, report that's come out for social prescribing. Um, warmest, warmest thanks. 